going on? Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In the Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. This is Monday, November the 9th, 2020, episode 40 of the show. However you listen to this thing, thank you for doing so. A number of ways to find the podcast, whether you are on Apple Podcasts or SoundCloud or your Android device or however you listen to your podcast, audio only. Please rate, review, and subscribe. If you're over on YouTube, all you need to do is search Matt Bernie or show in that search bar. You will get this episode as well as the 39 prior. And no, I'm not including the Breeders' Cup episode, the joint sort of in the money players podcast Matt Bernie or show. That doesn't count as one of the episodes anyway. I'm counting this as number 40, not that one. Uh, appreciate all the feedback we've gotten over the past few weeks. Uh, it's been a busy few weeks, obviously, going through the Breeders' Cup and a number of different things going out there. So thank you for the continued support. Um, If you are over on YouTube, make sure, again, you rate, review, subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down. Make sure you have the bell icon lit up so you get notified anytime new content is uploaded to the In The Money Media page. We'll kick things off here. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, You obviously can't see me. This week you're going to deal with the slate, and then you're going to be looking at charts. I've gone through and pulled the charts. I'm going to split this up into two episodes. So this week and next week, we'll be going through the Breeders' Cup World Championships that occurred this past Saturday and Friday, anyway, uh, of last week at Keeneland. Uh, We'll go with the last seven races here today in reverse chronological order, kicking off with the Classic. And then next week's, we'll pick up the balance of the Breeders' Cup races. We'll also get back into the Friday feature next week. I know it's been a minute, but if you go back to episode 38, the Friday feature was a race from Churchill Downs. Tom Espinoza, uh, I will reach out to you at some point, whether it is on Twitter or beneath the comment section here on YouTube, uh, and contact you about getting some sort of time set up for next Monday. I will contact you toward the end of this week about what race we'll be looking at. But Tom Espinoza is up for the Friday feature coming up next week. There will not be one here this week. Again, from a housekeeping standpoint, um, first things first, Breeders' Cup is in the books. Uh, Breeders' Cup betting challenge. Had a great time playing. Myself, Eddie Olchuk, we were kind of going over things while we were upstairs uh, in the green room down at Keeneland this past weekend. Uh, Tip of the cap to Marshall Graham and Jonathan Kinchin, and there are many others to, to sort of give credit to, but those two specifically for blowing the top off this thing um, and and making up your exacta for the BCBC and and giant, giant scores. This was one of those years where, I mean, there were multiple scores up over $100,000 from your $7,500 bankroll. So unbelievable effort from both of those individuals. And and look, again, I'm I'm pulling up the leaderboard right now as I speak about it. I think there were were six people up over $100,000. That's an incredible run. For what I thought were two days where, yes, there were a number of favorites and formful results, but there were just as many results that felt like, to me, and and again, certain people were were sharper than I in in certain races, but um, there were some results that I just, you could have given me $100,000 and I was never going to come up with those. Uh, So for those guys to get up there and do what they did, again, JK, well done, round of applause uh, for getting up there, and it looked like he had the thing sealed up. I, I, I sent him a text before the classic because I saw he had moved into position. He gave me a call, told me what he was alive to leading into the classic, and then uh, I saw him shortly after the race. Uh, and I said, "Did you win?" And he said, "Marshall snapped me at the wire with a seventy-five hundred dollar exact of authentic over and probable to get up there." So, uh, wild, wild situation for those guys to get through to, and. Uh, as far as I was concerned, it was just a, a weekend where I couldn't get anything going. It, it felt like nothing. I, I, I wasn't even alive for any real thrills at any point in, in the contest. I just, you know, doubles that I wanted to try to be alive to, a couple of them would have been in that sort of twenty to $25,000 range, and I couldn't even get through the first leg, which was very, very frustrating. And the only thing that sort of salvaged it for me was playing the, I had dutched three horses in a double into Authentic in the Classic. Um, one of those being Tarnawa. She ended up winning the turf. Authentic wins the Classic. It was $153 double, I believe. So it came back about 4500 bucks, and that was with the 1000 that I was going to sit on anyway. So I ended up at 5500 somewhere, give or take, you know, 50 or $60 bucks, um, for the weekend, which... Yeah, at face value, it's down 2000 from the $7,500 starting bankroll, but considering I qualified on horseplayers.com for $56, bucks, uh, i am certainly not going to complain 
about the 93rd, 90, where am I? Where did I finish? 82nd. Finished 82nd at 52, or excuse me, at 55, 28, 80. So, you know, again, not the showing that I would have hoped for. I, I, I just, it, it felt like a grind all weekend. I couldn't, just couldn't put anything together, and it is what it is. Sometimes that's how it goes. Um, and again, tip of the cap to everyone who played, and especially those of you who had some major success, or any real success, but some of you really, really hit a home run there. So I'll try to get back at it next year. In the meantime, we'll take the 5500 bucks and move on. Um, as far as, again, this week's show is concerned, that's what we'll be looking at, those sort of situations. Uh, really great response to last week's episode the Breeders' Cup feature. I thought all of you did a tremendous job. Some of you smashed it as far as your opinions were concerned. Uh, really well done there. Um, and, you know, for me, the, the Breeders' Cup was a tough one. Uh, only two for 14. Again, with Authentic being sort of the, the only, you know, interesting opinion that ended up working out. And again, he wasn't in any sort of great shake as far as price was concerned. He and Nick Sko were the only two that I ended up smoking out. But, um, it is what it is. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, I, I, I love the, the peanut gallery. Oh, you know, if you, if you follow, if you threw out all of his picks, you would have an exponentially better chance of winning. Hey, man, or gal, do what you got to do. I think your statistics are way the hell off, but I I really don't have the energy or desire to argue with with any of you. So do do what you want with any of my information. If you like my picks, great. If you don't, throw them out. I, I've, I've said that forever. Um, wildly, wildly off base as far as the percentages are concerned that you're suggesting. But hey, do it. What, whatever floats your boat there, kid. Do what you got to do. I'm going to do me. You do you. For this week, let's dive into a few of the races. We'll talk about some of the speed figures that have come back. I also have included my value line. What I had assigned each horse for what I consider to be fair odds in these races. And we'll uh, take a look and see where I was close and where I was well off. Um, so, there we go. Without further ado, let's dive into it. Let's take a look back at Breeders' Cup 2020 and we'll kick off with the Classic. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on all of these races, but we will go through them, at least discuss some of the horses, how the performances went, some of the quotes, some of the comments and things sort of in the aftermath. Here it is. This is the chart for the Breeders' Cup Classic down at Keeneland. We all know about the timing mishap. Um, it still blows my mind that these things happen on the biggest stages, but again, we're just we're just repeating ourselves at this point. Uh, Authentic gets the job done. 111 buyer speed figure. The Timeform US ratings, again, for those of you that are new to this show, I only look at the raw Timeform rating. I don't incorporate the pace adjusted one. Um, if you want to find that, you can find that in the Timeform US charts. But to me, I just I would rather go with the raw number and make my own conclusions. 111 Timeform, uh, excuse me, 111 buyer speed figure, 131 Timeform US rating, uh, improbable 108, 128, global campaign 106, 127, Tacitus 103, 125, maximum security 103, 125, tis the law 103, 124, uh, and then a, a pretty large gap back to the bottom four horses title ready by my standards, Tom's data and higher power. You can see that Timeform US had the mile split color-coded blue. I would imagine that is based on Craig Milkowski's sort of own uh, timing of things. And again, Craig is as good as they come as far as making sure times are accurate and things of that nature. So I have no reason to believe that that is uh, anything other than true. I, you know, I guess the first thing is, I thought this was, this was really the only opinion that I was really right about all weekend. And I felt very good about it. Um, you can see I, I thought he was, uh, from a value line standpoint, those of you that are unfamiliar with the value line, has to total 100 points. Uh, you divide the percentages, it ultimately spits out uh, what you believe fair odds would be. I thought he should have been 7-2. to two. He went off at 4-1. to one. Uh, You can see 7-2 to two for improbable. He went off at 7-2. to two. Global campaign, I thought he should have been 99-1. to one. He went off at 25. Tacitus, 49. He went off at 21. Maximum security, I thought was a terrible underlay. I thought he should have been 10. He went off at 4. Tis the law, I thought he should have been 6. He went off at 3 as the favorite, which is still rather surprising to me in the grand scheme of things. For the most part, the rest of them kind of checked out, including Tom Zeta. I had him at 4-1. to one. He went off at 4-1. to one. You know, I, I saw folks afterward, and I still see people talking about the, the fact that Authentic was gifted a, a rather cushy lead. I mean, I just don't, I don't know what you what po folks wanted to to happen because all these other contenders, I'm sure they're looking at it saying, if we try to run with them early, 
we're going to compromise ourselves. Perhaps we're in a situation where he's had back-to-back tough races. Maybe it took a little bit of the starch out of him. And if we can just sit just off, we can take advantage. And yes, improbable carried an extra, who knows how many, I think it was something like 65 or 70 feet. And yes, it equates to, you know, certainly at least five or six lengths. And if you look at that and say, oh, he ran the best race. I'm not trying to argue any of that. But if you went into it thinking you were going to get a different trip than you got with improbable, or you thought authentic wasn't going to be on or near the early lead, I, I don't know. You, you you clearly just looked at the race the wrong way. I, I, it seemed rather clear how it was going to be run. Maybe if you wanted to say global campaign needed to be more aggressively ridden, sure. But again, it would have probably been at their own cost. And when the horse runs third, he ran so much better than I thought he could have. And I need to admit where I was wrong there. He's clearly just a much better horse right now than I gave him credit for. How can you really second guess the, the, the connections and the ride that he received from Javier? The last thing you want to do is cook your own goose in what's likely to be a losing battle. If you think you can get a piece of this thing, or you think realistically you can sit off of a horse who maybe will regress off of a couple of big efforts, why wouldn't you take your chances and hope that that's going to work out? And if you're improbable, the added ground, sure, it's not ideal, but in, at the same time, he was in the clear, he had every opportunity, and yes, yes, that's going to take its toll, I get it, down the stretch. But he was in the clear, and he had every chance, and he couldn't go and get Authentic, who, yes, had the run of the race, Yes, he was out there by himself. Maybe ultimately he will go down as a horse who needed to have the lead. We'll never really know. But when he was able to get out there, he was a legitimately good horse. And I wonder if people are still going to just kind of look back, you know, uh, in hindsight and say, ah, he wasn't that good. He wasn't that good. Who knows? If he ended up with more adversity, maybe we would have seen more or, or a different dimension. But what we did see was a horse that when you allowed him out on the front end, he ran big races Coming into this, the reason I liked him, I've talked about it before. I think some of you at least considered it, and and maybe some of you should consider this if you're a fan of buyer speed figures. He had paired up career tops of 105. I, I'm telling you that that it doesn't always work, but nothing always works. If it did, it would be foolproof, and we'd all be rich. You pair up career top figures. I think it it could be a precursor to a forward move. It's exactly what you got here. He went 105 in the Derby, 105 in the Preakness. He moved up to a 111. Uh, the other thing that I really liked about him was, and I don't use them all the time, but they are legitimately good figures. Uh, you'll never hear me say anything negative about Jerry Brown and the folks over at Thoroughgraph. I think they do a great job. Based on his pattern coming into it, it looked like he was ready to explode, and that's why I, I kind of phrased it the way that I did, saying, I think he is breathing fire and sitting on tilt. I think he's going to run a big race. If you expected the pace situation to be different, I don't know what to tell you. It seemed like it was going to be rather tepid at, at best because you didn't have a ton of gas in there other than authentic. Um, the improbable, again, just an admirable horse. He is rock solid. He ran his race. And unfortunately for him, maybe this one didn't set up quite the way that some of the other races he's run in this year did. Um, still, he loses nothing in defeat to me. I, th- I think he is. I think he's the best older horse, pretty clearly. Uh, he should, I think he deserves an Eclipse Award for that. He won't be Horse of the Year. Authentic will be Horse of the Year. Authentic will be champion three-year-old, and deservedly so. Global Campaign and Tacitus, boy, the form of that Woodward that I was so dubious about. Uh, it looks pretty good now, doesn't it? They run third and fourth in the big one. Uh, and Tacitus, he just cashes checks, plain and simple. He, he's, he is far from the sexiest thing you'll ever see, but he just keeps running and... Good on him. You know what? He he may never be the superstar that myself and I'm sure many others had hoped and thought he may end up being at some point, but he cashes checks for the connections and he just shows up and runs. Maximum security, this was not a, a surprising result to me. You could make the case that he had the run of the race if, you, if Authentic didn't, uh, given his sort of vicinity to the front, out in the clear, perched. And he, when the real running started, he just had nothing. He was just very even. Uh, he's a horse that uh, there is a... To me, there is no two ways around it. There is a stark contrast between, uh, let's say, (laughs) I don't even know the right way to say this. Well, let's just say it. Service form and Baffert form. There is a stark contrast in the two. Uh, He, if we're being honest about it, he's probably not nearly as good as the form with Jason Service's barn is concerned. Um, This is probably more representative of what he is. And he's a fighter. He's, he's going to 
be one of those more polarizing horses, I think, in, you know, that we've seen in a long, long time. He does not deserve any of the sort of vitriol that he may have received from some folks. Um, I, I, th- I think his, his will to win is the best thing that he ever had going for him. His pedigree is pedestrian at best, and that's being kind. But boy, he wanted to beat you, and unfortunately for him, you know, when he, he when he was away from services barn, he was a fine horse. But that's just it. He was fine. Um, he wanted to try to go out there, and he gave you everything he had. Unfortunately, it just wasn't quite what you had seen with his prior trainer outfit. Uh, Tis the law. Tis the law is the one where I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of over it with some of the things that I've read from the connections. I mean, what are we doing here? You want to complain about the ride? Fine. He broke alertly. Maybe he should have gone on with it. Is that his best running style? I don't know. Uh, do you think you would have had a better opportunity to win the race if you threw it down with Authentic early on? Uh, maybe you would have. Um, the quote from Barkley Tag to me is borderline... No. I, I think it's a silly comment. You know, I, I I had, it was something along, and I'm pra- paraphrasing, I had the horse ready to go. I can't ride him. I mean, what did you want? Did you, he should have followed authentic. Did he not do that going in, all the way going into the far turn? He was down on the inside, and I get it. Manny had a stranglehold on the horse, but where was he going to go? Run up on heels? What did you want him to do? Oh, he doesn't like to be inside. Okay, again, if you wanted to make sure that you got out, from that position, then you also could not have complained if you rode the hair off him to clear to the front and ended up compromising. Because to be to be honest, rounding the far turn, and yes, he got a little bit of a shuffle, but when the real running started, he was flat. There was nothing there. To me, if if he was what I look, and, and I'm as guilty as anyone, after his travers, he looked like an absolute superstar. And if you take that Travers out of his overall body of work, you're looking at a horse who, if we're just calling a spade a spade, with the exception of that Travers, from a, from a number standpoint, he really hasn't gotten any better. He runs his race, going all the way back to the early season down in Florida. He's been a low 100 buyer type of horse, with the exception of that Travers. And he, he freaked out in that Travers. He ran his eyeballs out. And this is very easy to be sort of, you know, revisionist history. But you look at the field in the Travers, he ain't beat a hell of a lot. Then all of a sudden he runs into a horse in Authentic who, and I, there was someone involved in the ownership group who made some some sort of veiled comment uh, about, oh, well, you know, Authentic couldn't get, a, barely got a mile and an eighth in the Haskell and now he just kept going in the Derby. Again, it, it, an entirely wrong assessment of the fact that he couldn't get a mile and an eighth in the Haskell. No, he was just a big dope. The horse is still quirky. And it to me, it sounds a lot like sour grapes that you've been beat. When you faced not just one good horse, but in this instance, many good horses, you got beat. I, you know, there's not always going to be an excuse, or there shouldn't always be an excuse. Just accept the fact that you lost. If you genuinely believe the ride is what it cost you in the Classic, uh, we will agree to disagree. And I'd be curious what uh, you folks have to say beneath the video player on YouTube. I mean, was the ride the reason that Tis the Law finished sixth, beating, um, what, let, let me just eyeball it and say six six lengths? Because if, if it's if it's that simple, then, you know, I, I don't, and, and realistically, what other rider do you want? I'm not saying that, that Manny is, is, you know, the, the greatest of all time. But he's not a bum. Manny Franco is a good rider. And in this position, unless the, the instructions were explicitly clear, what did you want him to do? Get out there and duel on the front? I, I just, I thought his, the law was very flat. Period. He's a little bit keen down on the inside. And if he doesn't like being on the inside, guess what? You just kind of got screwed with the draw. But if you wanted him to make sure that he, he you know, oh, because I'm sure it would have gone the other way. If he ended up dueling on the front end, then would the excuse have been, oh, well, you know, you, you, you took away his best asset. That's his, his ability to sit and, and pounce. Well, I, you know, can't have your cake and eat it too. Those are the sort of things that irritate me. It's like, what did, what did you want him to do? 
And then again, when the real running began, and I get it, he got shuffled a little bit on that far turn. But he was just, he was flat down the lane. There was nothing there. I don't think he's progressed. And then you've got a chasm back to the bottom four. Disappointing effort from from by my standards. I'll be the first one to say it. I expected more from this horse, and he just, you know, my maybe I, I think my suspicions are, are correct. As much as I like him, and and I think he's a really quality horse. I said I would be surprised if he didn't run in the top three because I thought he'd give you what he got. He, frankly, he's just a notch below the the best of the best. Tom's de Ta. You know, it wasn't the best situation for him down the by the stands the first time. He was in a little bit tight, got pinched back. But even after that, he was another one who tried to make some sort of a bid round in the far turn. And he was just flat down the lane. And higher power, you know, uh, there's nothing really to say there. He, he just, he clearly, this season, I don't think his form was nearly what it was last year. Uh, nice horse. I think John Sadler did a really good job with this horse once he got a hold of him. He just, you know, it, it, it is what it is. He's, he's just a, a notch below here. So... Um, there it is. And I don't even know how many of these horses are coming back next year. I know Authentic's been retired. I don't know what the deal is with him. Probably. I think he's been retired. Not entirely sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, Maximum Security's been retired. I have no idea. Tom Zeta's retired. Who knows? So don't quote me one way or the other. But those are my thoughts on the classic. Let me know if you agree, disagree, and other pieces for this year's classic. Authentic gets the job done. 111 buyer, 131 time form U.S. rating. And it is off to the breeding shed. Breeders' Cup turf, a mile and a half, obviously on the grass. Uh, a, a race dominated by the Europeans, with the exception of Channel Maker, and this is a bit of a theme for all of the turf races this weekend at Keeneland. Uh, the Euros came over and just more or less waxed us. Um, this was, to me, one of the more impressive performances I, I can remember in recent memory anyway. And, and obviously, you know, you've got the likes of Enable and, and some of these other big horses that we've seen in recent years, but boy, Tarnawa, she was good. Um, admittedly, I was a little bit skeptical coming in, given that she ran so hard over that testing ground over a long shot most recently, but boy, she was sensational. In this race, you can see Time Form US has the mile and a quarter split color-coded blue, which just adds to the fact that Tarnawa's performance was even better maybe than it looks at face value. 109 buyer, 130 raw time form US rating. Magical runs second, 108 buyer, 129. Channel maker, 108, 129. Lord North, 105, 127. Mogul, 105, 126. Arklo, 104, 125. Medaya, 104, 125. And then a large gap back to United, Red King, and Donia. Um, I just, I was super impressed by this performance from Tarnawa because not only did she rally from off of let's just call it tepid fractions and if you really want to call it slow we can with that one slower fraction from time form us but she was wide she carried ground every step of the way she was probably two three paths throughout and then rounding the far turn she was even wider than that or the third of three turns and she kicked like an absolute mule down the lane it was it was visually it's what you look for you know talk about turn of foot that is the definition of turn of foot where when the button is pushed Boy, does she kick. Um, really an impressive performance from her. I had her 6-1 to one on my value line. She went off at 9-2. to two. Those of you that scored on her at 9-2, to two, um, she made that look like stealing because it was a really visually impressive effort. Magical loses nothing in defeat. Again, she's just rock solid. She shows up and runs her race. Doesn't matter where she's running, over what conditions, against who. Uh, she just shows up and goes. I mean, this is this race was probably not quite as impressive as her run against Nabel a few years back at Churchill Downs, but I mean, it, she just she ran another giant race. I had her at nine to two. She went off as your two to one favorite. Um, Channel Maker got to give credit to got to give credit to Channel Maker. You know, I I don't trust him at all at this point anymore. But this is three consecutive 108 buyer speed figures that he's earned. Obviously, at this point in his career, gas is the game. You got to go. And, and I know he has in the past been forward and, and offered little down the lane, but this is obviously his best running style. I'm not going to lie to you. Turn him for home. My heart sort of skipped a beat for a minute. I said, he gave him all the slip. He's going to win this thing. And he just couldn't quite hold off the big girls. Uh, but having said that, you know, you take a look at the way the race was run. And I know I'm talking about the slower pace, but when you factor in that, you know, a mile into this thing, or excuse me, with a mile left to go, you know, you've, you've got more or less 
horses who are mid pack and even further out of it that came and got this thing. And Channel Maker was the one cutting out the fraction. So I had him at nine to one. He went off at nine to one. Uh, you know, good ride from Manny and and good good on the connections. Good on Bill Martin, folks. It was a he's he's a he's a perplexing horse to me. I you know you, you almost feel like you got to approach him at arm's length because you know he can drop eggs. But you also know that he can be super dangerous when he feels like he's on his game. Uh, Channel Maker, good on him for running and getting a piece of this thing. Lord North, another quirky horse. Uh, he runs fourth. You know, I don't really have much to add there. Mogul, I was a little bit disappointed in the performance. He was the Euro that I wanted most anyway. I made him 9-2. to two. He went off at 4-1. to one. A little bit of an underlay there, but not much. Kind of splitting hairs, especially in the Breeders' Cup. Uh, he just, it, it felt like he never really got it going the way that I thought he would get it going. And perhaps it was taking on better horses. Perhaps it was taking on older horses. Perhaps it was the fact that despite the turf being listed as firm, I think there was a lot more give in that ground than than I certainly anticipated. And maybe that just goes to show how much rain they had down in Lexington, what was it, probably two weeks back now. Because you could see the the divots being kicked up and it just... Some of the some of the fractions I expected it to be a lot firmer than than maybe it was. I will say I love what everyone down there was doing as far as the measuring stick is concerned and, and sort of the the different areas of the turf. That should be standard operating procedure in the United States for all turf racing to give gamblers, to give handicappers, to give connections a better idea of what to expect, what kind of ground their charges are going to be going over. Uh, Arclo, I, look, I gave him a, a, a shot. He actually ran a big race if you look at it from a number standpoint, what he's accustomed to running. Unfortunately, he's just not as good as, as the proper upper echelon as far as world-class turf runners are concerned. Uh, and the rest of the field, uh, not much to add. Uh, the Southern California contingent, not terribly surprised that they were overmatched in here. Southern California turf racing seems like it is a notch below East Coast turf racing and certainly below European turf racing, uh, conversely. The Southern California dirt form, I think there is typically sort of, they have the upper hand over the East Coast dirt form and, and things of that nature. And Donia took a very awkward step down the backside for a moment. I thought he went wrong, and he just never really threatened at any point. He came in as a bit of a long shot, uh, and he ran like a long shot. So Tarnawa gets the job done. In my opinion, one of, if not the most impressive performance of the Breeders' Cup races. I'm mean, obviously not including the, the opener on Saturday. Um, which maybe I'll talk about in next week's show. But Tarnawa gets the job done. Really impressive performance from her and the connections. Thoughts, comments, X, Y, and Z beneath the video player on YouTube. The Distaff won by Monomoy Girl for the second time. Sounds like she is going to remain in racing for 2021. Again, don't quote me on that, but that's at least what I believe I have read. Uh, she gets the job done again. 100 buyer, 122 time form US rating is the even money favorite. Valiance runs second, 97 buyer, 120 time form US rating. Dunbar Road, 96, 119. Harvest Mood, 96, 119. CC, 94, 117. Point of Honor, 93, 116. And then we've got a little bit of a gap to Swiss Skydiver, Ollie's Candy, Horologist, and Lady Kate. Let's start off with Monomoy Girl. You know, uh, Jerry Bailey and Randy Moss discussed it on the NBC broadcast. You know, this is the trip that she wants. This is the trip that she gets, perched out in the clear, has every opportunity to go on with it. Yes, she carries more ground, but it enables or ensures that she's not going to have a straw in her path, won't have to deal with any kind of a troubled trip. If she's good enough, she's going to go and get the job done. I was a little bit concerned about the inside being favorable and that maybe that would be something that could potentially get her beat. She's just too good. Plain and simple. She's just too good. She goes and gets the job done rather comfortably in the grand scheme of things. And when you take a look and see the way the race was run, you see that the second, third, and fifth place finishers, and if you want to even go back to Point of Honor, they rallied from pretty far off of it. Whereas Monomoy Girl and Harvest Moon, and we'll get to Harvest Moon in a moment, they were reasonably close. Uh, Harvest Moon, obviously, she was cutting the fractions. But Monomoy Girl wasn't that far off the pace throughout while also carrying that ground. So I thought all around, this is a big league performance for a big league mayor. Uh, she's just, what else is there to say? She's top notch and, and she deserves to be the favorite in any race that she runs ever again. And if she never races in another race, uh, she will go down as one of the better fillies and mares that we've seen over the past uh, 10 years or so. And we've seen a number of really quality fillies and mares. She deserves to be in that same class as the Beholders, the Zenyatas, the Rachels of the world, and anyone else that I'm missing. Uh, great effort from Monomoy Girl. Uh, good on the connections. I thought she should have been 3-1, to one, and that was simply because of the presence of a horse like Swiss Skydiver. 
we have to talk about Swiss Skydiver before we get to anyone else because, unfortunately, I think we were a little bit robbed of what could have been one of those big matchups. It's the thing that everyone had sort of billed as as the matchup of the weekend, the showdown, because Swiss Skydiver unfortunately stumbled, and I think it was a pretty pretty good stumble out of the gate. And and you can't, I, I think it certainly changed the dynamic of the race when she is not as prominent as I think most of us, myself anyway, I, I shouldn't speak for everyone else, I figured she would be right there with Monomoy Girl throughout. And then we would have really got sort of the showdown turning for home. And maybe the result wouldn't have been different, but I don't know that we had the proper opportunity to see that. Yes, she she really flattened out down the lane, but to be fair to Swiss Skydiver, she needed to make a pretty legitimate middle move down on the inside to get within shouting distance uh, of the of the front runners. And, and I think that probably took a lot of the starch out of her. I'm not going to hold this race against her. I think, unfortunately, the start really compromised her chances. Um, Again, unfortunate that we didn't get to see the you know the the giant showdown that had been built, but uh, hopefully we get to see Swiss Skydiver again in 2021 as a four year old, uh, and she will go on to do bigger and better things. But unfortunately, Saturday was not her day. Valiance, maybe dirt is really what she's wanted all along. She won that run down there uh, in the Spinster as the prep for the local prep anyway for this race, and she, and she flattered that, came right back, and really ran quite well with the 97 buyer out in the clear Dunbar Road. You know what? Silly on me. I made her 24 to 1. She went off at 25 to 1. I should have known better because Chad did something very similar with Wildcat a couple years ago at Churchill Downs where they their final prep was less than stellar. And in hindsight, you go back and you look at the run from Dunbar Road, though, in that Bell Dame. She had to really make the move into a hot pace, and then she flattened out, and it was her first start in a couple months. So maybe the race really wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Um, I still didn't love her, so I'm not trying to make any excuses. I certainly wouldn't have picked her at any point. I picked Harala, just the winner of that Bell Dame, who was just terrible in the race, if we're being honest. Uh, but uh, Chad, typically when Chad's confident, or Ch- when Chad places horses in races, there's a reason. He, he's not going to just throw them in as as sort of, you know, thinking they're going to be also rands. And, and Dunbar Road came with a big effort, considering her odds and considering the form that she had shown. I thought Harvest Moon ran really well. Uh, this is a three-year-old filly that, assuming she comes back as a four-year-old, she's going to be sneaky, I think, next year. Uh, she really seems to have come into her own, given the fractions that were set, uh, given the way the race was run. I think this was a very, very credible effort for her. No reason to think that with uh, if, if the pace were a little bit on the more moderate side, even as fast as the track played on Saturday, There's no reason to believe that she can't be a major threat in this division next year as a four-year-old should she come back. Um, And she certainly is a a threat to run and win any of those big races for the Phillies and Mares in Southern California. CC, you know, I I don't know really where she falls right now. It it seems like she's plateaued. Uh, That early season form just didn't seem to sustain. It seemed like she tailed off form and, and... it's not that she started running poor races. It's just that she could she never sustained that that high level sort of grade one caliber quality that that she showed earlier this year uh, in that run in the Apple Blossom, and and she ran just fine to, to get to get fifth in this thing. But uh, it, I do wonder long term where she ultimately stacks up. Point of honor, the longer the better for her. Unfortunately, she doesn't possess a ton of early gas. Uh, already spoke about Swiss so Skydiver, and you've got the the three sort of. Horses that rounded out things at the bottom. Ollie's Candy, certainly a disappointing performance. But to be fair, she had run a lot this year, and she couldn't quite get the money in any of the big races, which is disappointing, obviously, for her and her connections. But she put together a pretty long, sustained campaign. Horologist, again, frankly, a disappointing performance. Uh, And Lady Kate, she looked overmatched on paper. She was part of that pace early on, and she paid the price. None of them could run with Monomoy Girl. She gets the job done the second time she's won the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Oh, buddy, the mile. Where to begin? Uh, an Aiden O'Brien trifecta in a race in the United States pays almost forty-five hundred bucks for uh, for fifty cents in a trifecta. Wild times, man. Wild times. Order of Australia at seventy-three to one gets the job done. One hundred five buyer, one twenty-one time form U.S. rating. Circus Maximus second, one hundred four, one twenty-one. Lope Fernandez, one hundred three, one nineteen. Ivar, one hundred one, one eighteen. Uni, one hundred one, eighteen. Uh, Halliday, one hundred one seventeen. 
Cameco, and you can just go down the entire list. All these horses are sub 100 buyers, sub 117 time form US ratings. You know, it, it, this was just one of those races where I'm watching it going, I think everyone, if you listen to uh, any podcasts or analysis leading into it, the mile felt like a crapshoot. Like it could go any number of ways and you didn't want to settle on a short price. The good news is, even if you liked a horse like Cameco, who I don't want to say he was unlucky, but he was down on the inside, down the stretch. That wasn't the most comfortable position to be in. Even if you liked him, you were getting five to one. So, I, you know, I'm not going to sit there and criticize anybody that said he's the play, he's the value. I didn't love him. I made him 12 to one, but, you know, he had every right to win a race like this. Order of Australia, you know, He's just difficult to come up with. And if you had him, I, I, I tip my cap to you and say you were better than I. I just, it was, he was exceptionally difficult to make. Breaking from the far outside, he wasn't even supposed to be in the race. He only drew in because one master uh, was a defection. Circus Maximus at least made some sense. Lope Fernandez at least made some sense. To me, anyway. Now, I'm saying made some sense. Obviously, I was way off on this race. So... For others, maybe this race was a lot clearer. I just, boy, you could run this race 25 more times, and it's just uh, a result that I'm never going to come up with. I'm just not. And and the good news is about these races, and I, I, I tell myself this, and I don't know if, if any of you do, when there's a result that you just are not capable of finding, uh, th- there's really no reason to lose too much sleep over it. That's the way that I look at it. It wasn't a matter of I was hemming and hawing between, oh, you know, I like this horse or this horse, and I chose to go one way or anything like that. It was just a race where you- I was flat out wrong. And that's going to happen sometimes. And to me, that's, that is that is an easier pill to swallow than making the wrong decision on a couple horses that I may have been up in the air on, one way or the other. This was just a race that, I, I just wasn't going to have. I did think Lope Fernandez was interesting at the price. Um, I made him 12. He went off at 18. This is a race, I'll tell you how I played it. I was trying to be alive in doubles to horologist in the distaff. Obviously, it wouldn't have made a difference because she didn't pick her feet up. But I used Lope Fernandez. I used Factor This. And I used March to the Arch. Just to give you an idea of how way off I was in this race. Um, I don't have a ton to add. Ivar ran quite well. I'll give him credit. He's a better horse than I thought he was. Um, You know, he I don't want to say he flatters the form of that run in the Shadwell, simply because I don't think that was a very good race. Uh, Uni, she came with her run. She was widest, unfortunately. I just don't think she's quite what she was last year from a form standpoint. Halliday, given the fact that he had missed a work, this really wasn't a terrible effort from him against the best company he'd ever faced. Um, The Chad... The two other Chad horses were, were disappointing. There's no two ways around that. Digital Age, give him the benefit of the doubt, I guess. He got out of the gate a little bit tardy, but at the same time, you know, his running style is a horse that you're going to take him back and make a run. Raging Bull, he's just, you know, he's he's a good horse. He is not, he will never go down as one of Chad's better horses. Um, and that's about it. It was It was just one of those bizarre races that, if you had told me on, let's say, Wednesday or Thursday of last week that you could take all of Aiden O'Brien's horses and you were going to get a try for 50 cents that nearly paid $4,500, I would have said you are crazy. And Pierre-Charles Boudot had a big weekend down at Keeneland, but uh, just a, a, a wacky result that... If you had it, I, I I tip my cap. I give you a round of applause because it is one that I don't know that I would ever have. Order of Australia wins the Breeders' Cup mile and pays just about $150 on top of Circus Maximus and Lope Fernandez. The European contingent, the O'Brien contingent, get the job done in the mile. Let me know how you all assessed this race going into it and did it jive or did it completely turn on its head as it did for me? beneath the video player on YouTube. The Breeders' Cup Sprint, probably the probably the best story of the weekend. The old boy Whitmore getting the job done at the ripe old age of seven. 
he wins the Breeders' Cup sprint in rather emphatic fashion by open lengths. 104 buyer, 119 time form US rating. CZ Rocket, second, 97 buyer, 112 time form US rating. Forenze Fire, 96 buyer, 112. Empire of Gold, 95, 110. Manny 95, 110. Diamond Oops, 95, 110. And you go on right down the list. Yopan finishes eighth as your six to five favorite. I, you know, it was an instance where it was a perfect trip for Whitmore, saving every inch of ground in behind a hot pace. Time form US had that opening quarter color coded red, meaning it was on the fast side. And it was uh, really in the grand scheme. If you look at the whole trip and the way Arad Ortiz Jr. rode, it was kind of a, a, a very, I don't want to say nonchalant. But there was never really a moment of panic at any point. It was as if everything just played out beautifully, saved every inch of ground, got him out to the clear, and he kicked on. And Whitmore is a fascinating case because he's an old gelding who it's hard not to root for him. We've all established that. It's a phenomenal story. But he's a horse for me. He was one of the more difficult ones to come up with this week. And and it's not because of what he's capable of or what he's not capable of it's just that I didn't think he was coming into this in particularly good form so when all of a sudden not only does he reverse the form but he wins for fun that was when I was just like I'm throwing darts right now because if if he's gonna win like that not based on his resume but based on the recent form coming in it was just a difficult outcome for me to envision but take nothing away from he, Ron Moquette, everybody involved. He, he ran, I mean, you, I would say pretty clearly the best race of his life. Um, I, I thought it was an interesting comment, and I don't know who it was beforehand who got a hold of him. Maybe it was Britt. Maybe it was somebody else on the Players Show. But the, the comment from the connections that this was not, in, in a sneaky way, this was class relief for Whitmore based on who he had been facing. And, you know, when you look back on it, or when I look back on it anyway, maybe I was guilty of not, you know, I, I didn't think this was a, a an historic rendition of this race, but to the Connection's point, I mean, it th- this was not a, a field littered with superstars, so maybe this was one that, you know, was ripe for the for the picking. Um, I made him 19-1, to 1, he went off at 18-1. to 1. Um, I thought CZ Rocket ran really well, and this feels like one of those where, you see a, a rather large discrepancy between the buyer speed figure and the time form US rating. Typically, we use that sort of 20 point differential to see if they match up. There's about a five point differential, oh, excuse me, a 15 point uh, differential here, so a five point difference. Um, you know, th- that's one that maybe in time we'll be able to have a better idea. I do understand the idea, though, that CZ Rocket ran effectively the same race he had been running in Southern California. And if you use. That is the barometer. He's been running 97 buyers. Then it all sort of checks out, and we know Whitmore is capable on his best day of running a, a mid 100. And that's according to time form. Uh, excuse me. According to the buyer associates, that's exactly what he did here on Saturday. Uh, Forenze Fire, as well as he ran, he still feels like that horse to me that he can't put together two really large performances. I think it is abundantly clear that he his best surface is Belmont Park. Doesn't mean that he can't run well elsewhere. But his best is at Belmont, and I think he has a difficult time putting together consecutive big, big efforts. He ran really well here, but uh, I would be curious to see what this would have been had it been sort of the second race from the big effort as opposed to the big effort coming in that most recent start. Uh, Empire of Gold, good on the connections. You know what, you're involved in that hot pace early on, and he stuck around uh, very similar to the way that we saw. And, and in reality, I mean, he was the best of, with the exception of Whitmore, he was the best of the horses coming from that local prep at Keeneland. Um, he ran really well. He, he's a neat horse, 51 to 1. Good on you if you had a piece of him in the Superfecta, uh, a super that paid something massive, didn't it? Uh, 10 cent super. 10 cents came back three grand. So, yeah, good on you if you had it for anything there or above. As far as the rest of the field is concerned, the, the main one that needs to be discussed is Yopan. You know, it was an interesting position. I get it. At the top of the lane, he's getting bounced around, pinched between, effectively takes up, um, and is out of the race. It's my opinion, and I'd be curious what all of you listening and watching have to say. 
I don't think he was really threatening at that point. I thought he had a really nice position throughout. Three wide perched out in the clear and then turn him for home. Things got real tight on him and he had to take up. But I don't think he was really going to factor in the result, to be honest. Um, That's just my opinion. And I can't help but wonder if the connections regret the decision they made by not running Nashville here. Because, and this is not meant to take away anything from Whitmore or anyone else in this field, but when you see what Nashville did in the opener and what he has done in all of his lifetime starts, I, I can't help but think he wins this race. And and perhaps the connections will look back on this and say it was a missed opportunity to get to get the big money, granted with an inexperienced horse, lightly raced horse, X, Y, and Z. All the reasons why maybe you want to go a little bit more on the conservative side and say, you know what, there'll be a time and place for him. But it's not as though Yopan was some, you know, horse who had a, a, a million races under his belt. Uh, he'd only run, I think, four times, one more time than, or one or two more times than Nashville had. So, uh, it, you know, again, very easy to sort of second guess decisions that were made or, or Monday morning quarterback it, but... Um, you do wonder, or I do anyway, if the connections, if there is a little bit of, of second guessing and regret saying, boy, no, seeing what Nashville has done, you know, maybe this was an instance where we could have got the big money. And instead, the old boy, Whitmore. And assuming he's happy and healthy, you would imagine he comes back next year. He's a gelding. It's not like he's going off to the shed. Um, he's a neat horse. He's a neat horse. He shows up and runs six furlongs, seven furlongs. He's run in the Met Mile before. Um, he's just, he's a neat horse. He, he's won at Saratoga, Keeneland, Oaklawn. Uh, he's just, he's just a cool horse and good on the connections. Happy for everyone involved with this horse. He gets the big money. Whitmore at 18 to one, the Breeders' Cup sprint winner. Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf, Odaria. Gets it done at 17 to 1, 103 buyer, 125 time form US rating. Rushing fall. We'll get more to the, the run in a moment. 102 buyer, 125 time form US rating. Harvey's a little Goyle, one of the three year olds in the field. She ran real big here. 102 buyer, 125. Lady Prance a lot, 100, 124. Civil Union, 99, 123. Sister Charlie, 99, 123. Mean Mary, 98, 122. And then a big gap to the rest of the field. Well, first, let's start with Starship Jubilee. It's really unfortunate for all the connections. You can't help but feel it's bad when it happens any day that your horse stumbles out of the gate and dumps the rider. It's like an exceptional gut punch when it happens in the Breeders' Cup because you never even had a chance. You never got to, you never got to compete. So you, you can't help but feel bad for everyone. Uh, I assume uh, Starship Jubilee is fine. We saw her basically cruising out there by herself. Knock on wood, everything is okay there. And obviously we know Florent Giroux was fine. He came back and won the distaff shortly thereafter. Um, Odaria, a really slick ride from Pierre-Charles Boudot, where he's able to get over, save the ground, made that move down the backside and into the far turn, where he's about a length behind a horse like Rushing Fall, who, I, it's my opinion, doesn't make it right, wrong, whatever. I think she ran the best race, given that she was in the clear wider throughout than a horse like Odaria was. She boxed on the way that she did. When you look and see the way the race was run and where these horses were positioned throughout the run, she was really the only one in reasonably close attendance to the pace that was around late. So all around, this was a giant effort for rushing fall. Unfortunately, she just couldn't quite finish the way that Odaria did. And I don't know that I want to say the distance is what got rushing fall beat. Um, It certainly didn't help her cause, but, but Odaria just, she just stayed. She kept going and she just, I think she had a little bit more bottom, and granted, she got a, what I think was a better trip than the one that Rushing Fall did. Um, so I'm not trying to take anything away from the winner, but it, boy, if you reverse the trip, she can't help but think Rushing Fall is the winner of that race. And and it is what it is. It's not like it was a bad ride by any stretch. It just, you know, that added ground being close to the pace in a race that had a reasonably swift one. You take a look, Time Form US color coded that mile split as the fast one of the entire lot. You know, it was a big effort from rushing fall and defeat. Odaria, though, give her credit, and that was the form that perhaps led some folks. You take a look. Uh, it wasn't that long ago. Tarnawa absolutely waxed Odaria, sort of foreshadowing leading to the turf just a few races later. 
Harvey's little Goyle, big effort from her. She won the QE2 Cup Challenge down there just a few weeks back. Flattered that. Looked real well down there. And, and maybe she'll be a big-time four-year-old uh, in these longer races. Who knows? We'll find out. I'm sure the Connections are anxious to try her on dirt again at some point as well. Lady Prance a lot. Big effort from her coming in from Southern California. She had also proven herself at Keeneland in the past, so this wasn't totally out of left field. Um, I mean, look, I thought... She was in way over her head. Obviously, as you can see, I gave her a 99 to 1 shot and she went off at 73 to 1. But, you know, if you were trying to draw up a case for her, she'd run well at Keeneland in the past. If you thought the pace would be hot, maybe she'd come running late. Uh, and she did just that. Civil Union, another one that rallied from off it along with Sister Charlie. Civil Union uh, is, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy because she is as lightly raced as she is, but she's five. She'll be a six year old here pretty quick. Sister Charlie, I think it's safe to say she has lost a step. Um, she owes nobody anything. She uh, has had a brilliant racing career. Uh, mean Mary, you know, at face value, I initially was really disappointed with the performance. But then going back and looking at it, you know what? Given the pace situation, distance is probably a little bit sharp for her. You know, was it a good effort? No. By no means was it, a, a you know, one that you're going to write home about. But it, maybe it wasn't the disaster that I initially thought it was because she dropped anchor pretty good. But again, when you factor in the pace situation, um, that, that was much faster than anything she had really been accustomed to, to dropping. Again, considering the distance being considerably shorter, um, not entirely unexpected. And maybe I should have, exp maybe I should have planned accordingly and knew that that was going to be a bit of an issue for her, but it is what it is. Uh, Odaria gets the job done over a gutsy, gutsy rushing fall who runs second to round out her career down at Keeneland in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. We'll wrap up episode 40 with the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, the only other spot that I was right all weekend. Nick's go airs in this spot. 108 buyer, 125 time form U.S. rating. Jesus's team rallies from off of it. 102, 120. Sharp Samurai, who encounters trouble, which we'll get to. 102, 120. Complexity, 101, 119. And the remainder of the field, sub 100 buyers, sub 118 time form U.S. ratings. Nick's Go is a wickedly fast horse. When he can get to the front, and that can't be overstated. He's never shown the ability to pass horses. When he gets to the front, he's a tough cookie. And especially when you add in the fact that he's at Keeneland Racecourse, a track that he absolutely adores, he's going to be a tough customer. Now, those fractions are blistering, and I get it. The times are a little bit weird because of the whole run-up and all that jazz. But, I, I mean, this is a big performance from this horse, and I don't know if he can sustain this. He's clearly an ouchy type. He hasn't run a ton in his career. He's had lengthy layoffs in the past. But, boy, is he feeling it right now. And, you know... I don't know what the connections want to do with him going forward, but he's he is an exceptionally fast racehorse. I would love to know, and maybe we'll never know because he's just that fast. I'd love to know what would happen if somebody could outfoot him early. Can he still win? Because again, he's never shown that to date. But if you think he's going to make the front, he's going to be a tough customer. Jesus's team, neat horse. Really nice little three-year-old. I think next year as a four-year-old, I could see him taking a step forward. I don't know if he's going to be a Breeders' Cup Classic type. Maybe he's that kind of horse that can win those graded stakes races at Monmouth Park, uh, the Islin, and some of those other types, the Monmouth Stakes. Uh, maybe he can get some of those one-turn miles down at Gulfstream Park. I see like the House Hope, the Gulfstream Park Mile, those sort of races. Um, but who knows? Maybe he ends up being bigger and better. You never know. He's a three-year-old, relatively like the race. Maybe he continues to improve. Sharp Samurai. Sharp Samurai, they did, Irad did his damnedest to try to make the front. He hustled him out of the gate. I thought it was a, I thought it was the perfect call to try to use, you got to be forwardly placed. You know you can't be rallying from too far off of it at this racetrack, given the profile, given the times that are being yielded. I'm not saying that it was a speed friendly or speed bias track, but again, obviously it's dirt. You want to be more forward than rallying from off of it. So Irad does what he possibly can to try to get up there. And unfortunately, things get super tight going into that turn. He's got to check off heels, gets shuffled a little bit. For Sharp Samurai to put in the bid that he did, it's making me wonder if he actually is indeed. And I know I said it after the Pacific Classic when he ran second. I said, you know, Mark Glatt is, is a sharp trainer. He's a smart guy. If he, if he thought that Sharp Samurai was genuinely a dirt horse, would he have campaigned him on grass all these years? 
And it's not to say that he's not a fully capable grass miler. We know that he is. But damn, if, if he hasn't run really well in these two dirt races, and if if I owned the horse and I had a piece of him or I trained him, my thought right now, and I don't know how he came out of the race or what the overall plan is, I would be circling the cigar mile. Because I think you're going to have a situation where there should be some pace, but I don't know that it's going to be an outrageous clip. You're going to have some horses who are more likely than not over the top. And I suppose you could say the same thing about Sharp Samurai. Maybe he would be one of those. We've seen this happen a number of times where the goal for these horses is the Breeders' Cup, and then anything after that is effectively an afterthought. But having said that, I do wonder if a horse like Sharp Samurai, you get him to a race like the Cigar Mile, maybe that's his opportunity to get a grade one on dirt. I'm pretty sure he's a full horse. You get a graded stakes win on dirt to go along with all of his graded stakes wins on grass. You know, all of a sudden you're putting together a nice little resume for a stallion somewhere. So Sharp Samurai, he deserves a lot of credit for running the way that he did, overcoming that adversity early on and being in a photo for the runner-up spot. Complexity. I don't think he loses anything in defeat. I know he couldn't hit the board here. But boy, with the way that the race played out, he missed a little bit of time there with the works leading into this race. I think he is ultimately best going one turn. But don't base that solely on this performance. Because, again, the the way that this race was run and the buzzsaw that he ran into, I mean, this was a difficult proposition for him regardless of the circumstances. I would imagine... Assuming he continues on, I, again, I don't know if they're going to retire him or not. He's one that I would certainly expect to see in the Cigar Mile, given the connections, given where they're all located. Um, as far as everyone else is concerned, not really a lot to say. Um, maybe the one that you want to sort of earmark here is, is Art Collector, because this was this is back-to-back really poor performances when the waters got really deep. And I'll go back to that run in the bluegrass. As, as impressed as I was... And you have all heard me time and time again with the lead change thing, lead change, lead change, lead change. And I thought maybe he ended up actually being a little bit more like Gunrunner, where it just genuinely didn't matter. This is two consecutive efforts against good horses that he just has not cut the mustard. And that run in the bluegrass was on a speed-friendly racetrack at Keeneland. And then he defeated a very subpar group in the Ellis Park Derby. So maybe he's been exposed. Uh, Maybe he's over the top. Who knows? But this is back-to-back real poor performances from Art Collector. I would at the very least be concerned um, if I were the connections and saying, ooh, something's not, we're, we're, we may have a little bit of an issue here. Uh, but as far as the rest of the field is concerned, don't really have a lot to add. Uh, it'll be interesting to see some of these horses, I'm sure, will at least try something like the Clark. I could see a horse like Mr. Freeze trying to go to the Clark Handicap, maybe Art Collector. Um, I believe War of Will is done. He's been retired. Um, but all in all, I mean, it was a, a land speed record, if you will, for Nick's go. And again, when, when you let him get out there on the front end, he's going to be a dangerous horse, especially a Keeneland race course, a track that he has done his best running. Uh, we'll find out where he ends up going down the road and, and what spots the, the connections consider running him or not running him or whatever the case may be. But uh, there you have it, the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. This is the last race I will discuss here on this episode the remaining seven I will go over next week along with the Friday feature again featuring Tom Espinoza. Uh, however you listen to this podcast, thank you for doing so. Uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts or you're on SoundCloud or you're on your Android device or in the moneypodcast.com, just however, please rate, review, and subscribe. It means a great deal to all of us. If you're over on YouTube, search Matt Burner, your show in the search bar. Make sure you are subscribed. Make sure the bell icon's lit up so you get a notification anytime new videos have been uploaded to the channel. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. It doesn't make a difference to me, but more interaction, the better. And, and as always, I encourage everyone to leave comments beneath the video player. I think it's a nice little forum. People can riff back and forth. Um, If you want to throw, you know, different ideas out there, by all means, that's the spot to do it. Beneath the video player on YouTube, on Twitter. You can follow me at Bernie or underscore Matt. I'll be back next Monday with episode 41. But until then, this has been episode 40 of the Matt Bernier Show. Good luck however you play, whatever you play, and wherever you play.